So, how do we see the world? I think about the wonderful writing of Antoine Saint-Exupéry in this lovely little book, The Little Prince. On the opening page, the scene is set. Two men are talking to each other. One says to the other, what's your house like? And the answers, my house is worth £100,000. And the man asks him back, what's your house like? And he says, my house is covered in roses. And so the scene is set that there are possibly other ways of looking at the bigger world. I've always followed a great American photographer called Minor White. And one of the great statements that he made in his spirited photography was this. Go out and photograph a, lamp, a landscape for what it is, and then go out and photograph it again for what else it is. And so it gave me clues that there are different ways of being in the world. As a child, I was brought up in a suburban household on the south of Manchester, and we had a garden with, surrounded by a hedge, and there was a hole in the hedge. And I was dying to go through that hole. It was so important to go into this other world. And I'd squeeze through the hedge and disappear for the day. And out there was a reverie of a new world. It was quite without rules. It was, ex it was completely interesting to explore. And I saw the hedgerows and understood things that I'd never understood before. I saw the sycamore leaves, the frog spawn, the small sticks and stones that I took home in my pockets and filled them and took them to school, put them on the nature tray and learned their names. It's so important to learn those names. And as I grew up, I got into what I regarded as exploration in some way in my life. I explored the nature of the rock at its treacherous end. I was interested in the adventure, for example, of rock climbing. I was doing a lot of kayaking as well. And as I left my teaching career, I suddenly realised there was more in the world. There was more out there in the natural world than I ever imagined. And then after traversing some great peaks in Scotland, actually, the um, north face of Ben Nevis, initially, I suffered a terrible accident out there uh, back in 1974, but continued to develop my skills, both in glaciated scenery in the Alps and also in the wonderful cooling mountains of Skye. But there was more. And I decided to leave that teaching career and embark on a job that was going to pretty much change my life. And I applied to go to Antarctica with the British Antarctic Survey. And to go down on this very brave boat, the John Biscoe, back in 1981 into the fastness of another world. My job there would be to look after a geological scientist and to take him out into the wilderness of Antarctic Peninsula into the mountains and across the glaciated seas and uh, frozen seas and islands and collect samples of rock. He was an eminent geologist and his name was Brian, Brian Storey. We began in this center, um, this ice station on uh, Adelaide Island called Rothera and our duty was to go out for three months out into the wilderness and camp and collect the rocks. Now these tents look unsophisticated, but actually inside they're very sophisticated and life in the tent becomes comfortable. Three layers to sleep on, a tilly lamp to warm yourself on, and so on, and good communications with the outside world. But we are gone for three months, so we have three months food. But on this occasion we were ensconced at one point for five days in a very, very big storm. The wind blew at 100 miles an hour, the tent was buried, and we maintained communications with the outside world through our radio. Brian um, <clears throat> was a good companion, but I didn't know him very well. The first encounter with, with him was literally camping in the tent and going about the business of expeditioning. And then one day, um, I was reading a book, a novel, which traditionally we would tear a page and share it, tear a page and share it. He didn't have a novel, but he did have something else. And so I had this ghastly experience of watching him struggle with the Rubik's Cube until at last he solved it and we could just share the novel again. <laughs> but during that time, we also were allowed in 1981 to relay 100 words out, outside of Antarctica back to Britain to a loved one. And I'd only just recently left a girlfriend that I was very, very keen on and I realised I was going to have to relay a message to her through this telex system in front of Brian. So this was the, the worst and most ghastly occasion. And the radio operator said, come on, John, what's your message? And I looked at Brian, and I could see his toes curling already. 
And my message to my friend Jan at home was as follows. My darling Jan, I miss you so much here in the terrible cold. I miss the warmth of your body and your scent like flowers in the spring, etc. <laughs> and the radio operator came up to Brian and said, come on Brian, what's your message now to your loved one? And he said, my girlfriend's called Rose. Just put what John said and sign it from me. <laughs> so, du during, during that storm, one of the aircraft at Rothera Station, one of our support aircraft, actually took off and turned over on the airstrip and it was uh, broken up and of course we had to leave Antarctica. But I was contracted back with Brian to go on the research ship Bransfield and to tour the Antarctic Islands, an experience I simply didn't expect to have. And so I saw wonders in Antarctica, uh, the most incredible things, some sights and sounds and experiences <laughs> deep into nature that would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, to experience in any other way. And so a door opened in my mind about the future of what I might do. I might try and be a photographer. But still there was more exploring to do. So having got home to England, I straight away mounted an expedition to attempt to ski across Greenland. And this became one of the most significant <coughs> events in my life and something that I've referred to always concerning some of the things that happened on that expedition. The distance across Greenland is 400 miles and we eventually took 44 days to cover that distance. We took no radio, we had no means of communication. It was real commitment, it was the real thing. It was a complete unknown and it was the unknown that I needed. And so we set off up to an elevation through great difficulty of stressed ice and ice lakes and crevasses up to the distance of 5,000 feet above sea level. We're trying to follow a route taken by Nansen, the, the uh, Norwegian biologist, 100 years earlier. To us it was arbitrary, it was a mere pencil line for our simple magnetic compasses. But we followed the spirit of it until we were high on the plateau and experiencing some pretty nasty weather. 70 mile an hour winds encumbered us and caused us to camp down for two or three days. But the opposite side of it was that we were out in some wondrous light. In the dawns and dusks, which for us was midnight, the sky was lit with colours. It was lit with this phenomenal parhelia formation where the sun rises through the ice clouds at night and refracts across the horizon. 200 miles from the end, near the centre of Greenland, we came across huge crevasses. We struggled for days and days, made some ground, but eventually decided to abandon the sledges and walk out. And suddenly, after four days of walking, we came to the edge. Without a, almost a hint, because all the ground of the mountains on the west coast of Greenland was hidden. And we stepped from ice onto rock, and from rock onto heather. And suddenly the world was filled with new senses flooding in. The sense of smell, the earth, the flowers, cottonheads, bubbling streams, caribou, muskox, falcons, stimuli that I did not expect that was overwhelming. I looked back across the ice and imagined that I was an astronaut coming in to land, coming in from an area where I had been so deprived I had simply forgotten the world. I would stepped away. And as I made that 40 mile trek through the coastal mountains and tundra of the west coast of Greenland, I began to fear the world ahead. Because the world ahead was relationships, mortgages, city, underpasses, traffic lights, roundabouts, commerce, work. And those things to me are more complicated in life than the survival experience I'd had where I merely took the pressure of the sledge pulling that weight across the ice and feeding myself at night. Where my only vision was the sky through my hood without communication to friends. And I realised that survival was easier. And I've taken that sort of metaphor throughout my life and used it as great strength for me in the future. Another extraordinary example of being in 
deeply immersed in the natural world is in contact with animals. Not just contact, but eye contact. And when an, a wild animal actually looks at you, that in itself is an extraordinary experience. And there's one particular event happened to me in the country of Namibia in Africa, a moment I simply never expected to happen. We were hiking up in the district called Damara land, which is north of the great Namib desert. It's a region of stony mountains covered in crystals. And I'd heard that there were some wild uh, mountain zebra out in that region. They're very rare animals, they're unlike the plains zebras of Tanzania and Serengeti and so on. And so I set off alone one day with a knapsack along a tiny mountain path just round the back of this mountain that you can see. The animal track was only a foot wide and I disappeared around the edge to see what was round the back, to see if I could create a viewpoint to see some of the open gravel areas where the zebras might be. As I came around the mountain, suddenly I saw 20, 30, 40 baboons on the path. And they were looking anxious at me and I knew straight away not to have eye contact with them but to look away. And I just stood still, perfectly still, looking at the ground and I was aware that more and more baboons were amassing. One baboon is okay, two or three are just about okay. But 40 to 50, starting to get agitated by my presence clearly, was very worrying. So I stood still and just waited. And sure enough, after five or ten minutes, they calmed down and they melded away down the gorge walls at the side and I proceeded along the path. Within 300 metres round the path and hidden from my initial view, I came across an extraordinary sight. It was a mound of crystals. It was this high. And atop the crystals was the skull of a baboon. Well, this was very curious. I was most interested. Who has built this cairn? Did the baboons build it? Did Himba shepherds in the district very ancient Stone Age people build this cairn and revere the baboon by adorning it with a skull? I didn't know. But what I did realise is that while I was looking at the cairn of stones, the baboons were returning. And this time, they were blocking my path home. And so we now have 40 to 60 baboons getting very agitated and screeching and picking up stones and appearing from other small channels and tributaries towards me. And now I'm actually very frightened. I'm not sure whether to run. There's no point in hiding behind the cairn. The baboons were going to have me. And as I watched this unfold, I saw in the far distance one particular male baboon on the skyline and in my tremulous fear at that moment I decided instinctually to raise my arm in some kind of gesture I did not know what to the baboon and the baboon raised its arm it repeated the gesture and I lowered my arm and as it lowered its arm following my movement, all the baboons quiesced and they flooded away quietly down the gorge walls and left me to walk home freely back to my Land Rover. Now that was an experience I knew not what. I have no explanation. We've had a day where we've heard a lot of science. I have no science for that fact. I can only relay this extraordinary experience to you. And closer to home, in the Peak District of Derbyshire, <coughs> where I live, I go out every day. I find it very important to go out every day and to experience the landscape around me, to try and connect. It's like the great words of John Muir, the great writer at the turn of the century. He found that going out was actually going in. To study those things, to look like a child with child's eyes at that landscape that I've loved all my life and to understand it, to even understand the science of it, but what does it do to you? And so, as the winter approaches, every year I get more excited because I love the winter. I love the harshness and hardship of it. 
And out on the moors near my home in the Peak District of Derbyshire, we have high moors that behave like tundra. And every winter time I put my skis on and I go and look for an extraordinary animal, the mountain hare. And the mountain hare is one of the few creatures in Britain that turns white in winter. And so I go and pursue that thing. It's only a small group and it's very rare in that part of England. And then one day I decided that I'd come down in the dark and experience the night time on the moors. The snow at that time was nearly waist deep and I entered a woodland. And as I entered the wood, the moon rose. And it, it shone extraordinary light through the branches so strongly that they became patterns on the snow. They were repeated like the roots of the trees. They looked exactly like the roots of the trees, but they were only light and shadow. The air was filled in the snow so lightly that I could not feel it round my legs. And as I waded through the shadows and the light, I wasn't stumbling. I wasn't stumbling in the actual fact of them being tree roots because they weren't tree roots, they were only shadows and light. And as I tumbled down the hillside in this drifting air, I felt myself again leaving the world. And had those same experiences I had crossing Greenland or climbing great mountains, that it is possible to enter a reverie in a different way in connection with nature. And I think about the wonderful words that Wordsworth said as he lays in the fields above Tintern in the Wye Valley all those years ago. That serene and blessed mood when even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things Thank you very much.